You're just in time for Business News on Y254 channel. Very good evening and thank you so much for joining us here on Y254. My name is Miriam Masava. You can interact with me directly on social media. That is Miriam underscore Masava. That is Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Today on our discussion, we're talking about food safety in the country. Well, cases of aflatoxin has been reported. How safe is your plate of food? Food for thought. <laughs> Be part of this discussion on our social media platform using the hashtag Y254 updates or you can tweet us on Y254. That is our handle on Twitter. Yes, and to help me discuss this is that is on my far left. That is Andrew Shonko, business analyst. Thank you so much for coming, Andrew. And we have Dorcas Jalango, agriculture economist. Thank you so much for joining us here on Y254 Business News. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Well, we've had cases of aflatoxin in our maize, peanuts, and even milk and meat. Is in our food, the plate we have tonight or the plate we'll have tomorrow, you're not even sure if it's safe or not. But let me ask something very basic. What are the causes of aflatoxin? If I may start with you, let me start with, <laughs> with Dorcas. because I know I, I, she knows why I'm starting with her. Um, aflatoxins come in various ways. Mm. And unfortunately, we're only looking at it from the aspects of it came from the supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why yeah. maize, the maize flour and other products were withdrawn from the shelves. Mm -hmm. But in actual sense, it comes from the seeds, from the supply of the seeds. It comes from the farmers, how they undertake their production. It comes from the <coughs> processing, mm -hmm. from how the food is distributed, mm -hmm. from how it is uh, stored in our shelves, mm -hmm. and from how it is stored in our houses. So it's a whole chain link. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's, it's, uh, it's not just the maize you purchase on there. No, no, no. Unfortunately, the, 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 the maize flour, you go to the supermarket and purchase it. Unfortunately, we all think it's the supermarket or, where, or the shops. Mm. That's where it comes from. Mm. But in real sense, it can come from anywhere. That's the truth. That's mm. the harsh truth about it. So you all need to be vigilant. <laughs> yeah. And are the buyers aware of a few texts in? Uh. To, to a common manager, is he, is he or she, are they aware of a few toxin? I think they are not actually aware, mm. and uh, that is a missing link that uh, is actually there so much because them not being aware of what they are consuming, them not being aware on how the product was produced, mm. how the product was transported, how the product was handled through <coughs> all through the all value chain, uh, the way it was uh, packaged and so on. They don't actually realize on some of the uh, impact and some of the effect that actually come along with the, the kind of food that they, uh, they produce. And this is because they, there is no uh, teaching and trainings on how the food that we eat is uh, being processed and how it comes to land actually to your plate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, if the, this media house did not do that expose, Maybe people who are not even aware of the aflatoxin in their food, on their, on their milk, in their meat, in every other kind of food. Is our, is, is our food safety culture up to standard? Dorcas. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. And um, our focus has been on maize, mm. but generally food safety of many products is at stake. Mm. We just focus on maize because it's a staple food. Everyone eats maize all the time and in large quantities. Yeah. I think everyone is affected on this maize shortage. That's why much focus is on maize. But generally, our food safety standards are not up to task. Even the vegetables we consume, if I ask you today, do you know the nutritional content <laughs> of the skumawiki you are eating? No, you don't. <laughs> uh, again, if I ask you if uh, how aware are you of uh, how to store your food, of how to prepare it. Mm. We are so blank. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we're all pointing fingers. Oh, it's the supplier. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's the farmer. But one thing I'd like to like enlighten us, it's 
all of us. It's a combined effort. Mm -hmm. Because do you know that you can buy the maize from, it's not the first time we've had these cases mm -hmm. of aflatoxins. Just that this case, it was on the supplier side, mm -hmm. which are the maize distributors, mm -hmm. or rather the supermarkets, where we get our maize from. Uh, a, while back, a while ago, it was NCPB, mm -hmm. because NCPB does bulk of the storage of maize. And there were concerns of maize being contaminated. Mm -hmm. So NCPB is aware, them they're aware, just that we don't have the, um, the, the, the safety standards have not been implemented, implemented to the latter. Mm -hmm. But even us, at the household level, I'll talk of the household level because you're the consumers. Okay. We determine what you consume. Even us as the, at the household level, we are not aware, aware. And he's mentioned something that is key, something of awareness campaigns or trainings. But one thing we should know is that even if they were to train, they couldn't cover all households. So at some point, I insist and I insist, we also, there's negligent on our part as consumers. <laughs> I have a phone here. Oh. <laughs> I have internet. Mm -hmm. How many of us just take time? Google is our friend, we say that. How many mm -hmm. of us take time and look at causes of aflatoxins? But not everyone has access to smartphones. <laughs> but how many? How <laughs> many? By the way, if you compare technology in Kenya to other mm -hmm. developing countries, mm -hmm. we are way much ahead. Mm -hmm. Compared to Nigeria, compared to Tanzania, we are way much ahead. But who is to, to be blamed for the contaminated means in the country, the rise of contaminated means in the country? Um, Okay, we, let me say the government, everything that happens is say our government, our government. Mm -hmm. uh, of course our government is mandated. That's mm -hmm. why we have the Ministry of Agriculture, mm -hmm. we have Ministry of Livestock, we, all, we have all these agricultural ministries mm -hmm. that are mandated to ensure mm -hmm. that whatever the citizens consume, it is their work. But that shouldn't mean that we are seated, because the government will take care of it up to some level. You see, they could only reach the supermarket. Mm. No one went to our homes and looked at the maids we are consuming and measured their flatoxin levels. You'd be surprised, by the way. Mm. Yes. Hey, is this story, this issue of aflatoxin and the contaminated maize, is it true or is it just an expose on the media house? I know the media houses. It's not actually an, an expose because uh, research has been done. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe other people, you know, Kenya, we have this uh, culture of or politicizing everything. They say so, maize is a political crop. Yeah, it's yeah. a political <laughs> crop and so on. People want to say that they want to kill their brands and so on. But in the essence, that is not the truth. There is actually a high level of, uh, of truth uh, on uh, the expose that, that was done. And I'll mention two things that are has actually been eating uh, the people greed and, and ignorance. We have this culture of uh, <coughs> if we want something, we'll use any means to get it. Like for example, people can actually, uh, there are agencies that have been mandated to make sure that the products that come inside our country are actually safe for consumption. There are policies that have been put in place, but do we actually follow these policies to the latter? Mm -hmm. Sometimes there are cases whereby money is dished out for people who, have, who are in these agencies to actually allow this product to come into the country so that it can be sold to the, to the common monainji. On, on the other side of the common monainji, we are asking a question of, do they actually consider some of the things that are actually being mentioned? This is something that uh, came just a week ago, but it has been there for some time. In 1981, it was there. Mm. In 2004, we had a case in, Ma, in McQueen where about 100 people died, mm. and it was actually the cause of aflatoxin. Mm. But there are, no, there are no measures that were put in place. We are so reactive instead of being proactive. It happened. Put, uh, put policies in place and make sure it doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, a few days ago, we saw caves coming out strong and burning a few millers. Uh, is, it, is, it, is it just an attack to these millers or is it genuine? Were they waiting for, for these media houses to expose it? Or where, 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 where is the missing link? Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow. What a question. Yes. yes. Um, we have very many missing links. Mm. He's spoken about policies. Mm. Surprisingly, Kenya is one of the countries that has one of the best policies mm. in the developing world context. And 
countries have borrowed our policies and implemented them. So our problem is the implementation. Like CABS, mm. CABS has standards. I'm sure if you go to the CABS offices, there are standards and procedures mm -hmm. before a product is released to the market. Yes, they follow it, but not to the latter again, I insist. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's corruption. We cannot rule out corruption in Kenya that someone went, a, a, a CABS officer, it's, it's been there in the news mm -hmm. several times, a CABS officer went to the field, did, uh, did the surveillance or the, 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 the standards or, or, the, or the protocols they use to assess or ascertain that this product is free from aflatoxins. And um, they got the reports, but some of them are compromised. Mm. and they release the maize into the market. Mm. But if you see something of the sort happening, trust you me, give it time, <coughs> you'll hear of cases of people have been infected. It, uh, the, the bomb is just about to blow. Mm. <laughs> it's just mm. about to go boom. Because, it's a ticking bomb. Yeah, it's a ticking bomb. Mm. Because um, if, you, if, you, if you assess clearly, we had peanut butter just before maize, mm. those peanut sure. butter. Do you know if toxins are higher in peanut butter than any other crop? Okay. Number one, mm. the number one crop that's more susceptible to aflatoxins mm -hmm. is peanuts. Peanut butter. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then followed by these other cereals, which is maize, even rice has. But they say rice is the safest food at no, the no, moment. No, 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 no. Rice has, rice, rice has chances of aflatoxins. Just that, they, actually, there are like, I think, 13 or 14 varieties of aflatoxins. Mm -hmm. And they are just, there's just this one that is very harmful for human consumption and also animal mm. consumption. Mm. So there are bottlenecks, yes. And uh, I blame KEBS, yes. And again, I don't blame KEBS. Mm. Because what I know, what KEBS does is, um, I've mentioned, they test the product. Mm. But it shouldn't stop at that, that if they don't do it once. Like I did it in January, mm -hmm. and then I leave it. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to do it like randomly. Mm -hmm. So, and again, uh, there's no aflatoxins. There's no way you can eliminate aflatoxins 100%. They have to be there. Just that there's a standard level that if they, it surpasses, it's very harmful for consumption. You cannot have maize that is 0% aflatoxins. Mm. Mm. So yes, I blame cabs. There are loopholes, uh, especially when it comes to these large maize millers, even the smaller ones. Mm. The smaller ones that are, are, that are at a higher risk because they don't have the right, correct mechanism. They don't have the, uh, the capital they need to implement or rather to make sure their products are free from aflatoxins. Mm. The large millers on the other hand have the capability, but there are loopholes in following the standard protocols and procedures because these aflatoxins have to be tested for. Okay, okay. Andrew, let me ask you, do this, the common farmer back in Transoya with one acre of land, he has planted and he wants to go sell his maize to National Cereal yeah. and produce board. Yeah. Do, 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 does he know the importance of testing the maize before selling it? Actually, they don't know. The ignorance they totally the don't know. But sometimes we can say they are ignorant. Mm. And, uh, or they, they, are, uh, they have not been sensitized. Yeah, they, have not, <clears throat> they have not been uh, uh, sensitized. We need actually to devolve some of these things. Before, because uh, if we mandate the issue of maybe checking the aflatoxin level to only maybe the mm. NCPB mm. and uh, maybe caps, we need actually to devolve some of these things. Like before the product is, is sold from the farmer, it needs to be tested. Is it, is it the, the harm that uh, it will uh, cause to, uh, to this consumer and so on? That's why at the beginning I said the, the value chain need to be checked from the beginning to the end. Before that product product is even planted. Mm. Before it's, it's plant, planted, it needs to be checked how it grows, the kind of chemical, the chemicals that are, that are applied. And we are saying actually aflatoxin is not only in, uh, in, uh, in maize. We, we find maybe uh, we meat, milk, mm -hmm. because if, if these products are fed, because when you have a sack of maize that uh, cannot be sold, it's actually fed to chicken. It's mm -hmm. fed to cows, mm -hmm. and at the end of the day, the same products that will come from those animals will actually be fed by animal, by a human being. You, you, you will think that you have uh, escaped the, this thing, and it will actually follow you to the end. So, sensitization need to be taken to the ground level. Mm -hmm. Sensitize people. Let people know the kind of product they are taking. Let people know that they can take action when they find these products that are not good for consumption. People are still buying the products that will actually be bad. I'm asking, uh, uh, the extension officers, are they sleeping on their job? Of course, <laughs> of course, 
by by large mm. by large they are doing so because let's say for example i have let's say 1000 bucks mm. and maybe this one 1000 bucks were supposed to give maybe 2 million or 3 million shillings mm. and then you come and you tell me that these products that uh, that i have have a uh, aflatoxin and uh, they need to be maybe discarded if i tell you that maybe i'll give you like a million mm -hmm. making a million in a day mm. <laughs> yeah, of course they'll be compromised. You know, the board, the National Cereal and Produce Board has assured Kenya that the maize is safe for human consumption. But we find the, the maize, the flour we buy in the supermarket and the shops is contaminated. Um, maybe. NCPB may be right. Yeah. Because they are the main grain reserves. But so maybe, let, the, let grains, me, let me, maybe let me. the grains they received. Mm -hmm. But then they have this equipment for measuring moisture. Mm. Actually, aflatoxins is a fungal infection. Mm. And if fungal is given the conducive environment, it will continue growing. Mm. So they have uh, mechanisms and uh, tools and equipments for, you'll find like every a few hours they measure moisture, they measure temperature, mm. so that they regulate. Mm. So maybe from their end, and I'm not coming to their rescue, mm. from their <laughs> end, by the time they are receiving this maize from the farmer, mm. it was okay. So we can't really blame NCPB. But what happens after it's released to the millers? How was it transported? Was it put in sacks? Was it just laid? Was it exposed to moisture? Another thing, from the, who, fo who follows this due procedure of, from but, NCPB? But there was a time this, this National Cereal Board claimed that their storage is full. So the maize was being rained on. Could this be a cause of it? I know they received it was okay, but, how but long it was rained on. How long ago was that? How long ago was that? What's the time period between when the maize was rained on and now the aflatoxins we're having? It can't be over one year because mm -hmm. we consume maize literally. A lot of it maize. It's a staple food, yeah? Yes. Mm. So how long ago was it for us to blame, to blame uh, NCPB? And by the NCPB, when they cannot take anymore, they don't take. That's why farmers complain. We took our maize, it was rejected. Mm. So chances are that maize was returned to a farmer I stand to be corrected. That maize that they rejected because their stores were full was returned to a farmer. Uh -huh. This farmer so sold their maize to brokers. These brokers collected maize from 100 farmers in a village. Mm -hmm. These brokers took the maize to where? To the local millers. Mm -hmm. No one measured that. So we cannot entirely blame NCPB. <laughs> Yeah, we need to. We also need to sensitize our farmers that when, I, when my maize is due mm -hmm. and I've taken it to NCPB and I take it back home. How do I store it? Mm -hmm. You wanted to add something, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah maybe, maybe I can jump in. Uh -huh. NCPB, how, how can NCPB uh, authorize the return of maize that actually them, they feel like this maize is not actually good for consumption? We need to actually look into policies of standardization mm -hmm. that, are, that have actually been stipulated so clearly by, uh, by KEBS. Because when you are, we are exporti uh, exporting a product outside mm. the country, mm. we actually make sure that this product is so standardized in a way that uh, when it goes to that, to that other country in which we are, we are exporting, uh, exporting the product to, it doesn't have, have any issue that will come up because we want to protect the market. Why are we protecting the market? And charity actually begins at home. Mm. Let's first protect ourselves, make sure that the product that we are taking is not good, Sensitize mm -hmm. this, let people know mm -hmm. that this thing will come and cause effect to you. If, if let's say, for example, that uh, that product is uh, is returned, maybe uh, they, they are told that just mm -hmm. take, we are not going to take this product. That product will actually go to the market, and in a way, it will actually find its way back to the cereals, to, to our cereals, because if it's sold mm -hmm. uh, to those Raja Raja people, people will consume it, or maybe in the in the NCPB, there are actually people who are crooked. Mm -hmm. They'll actually be able to accept this product when other eyes are not watching. And do sometimes Miller buy direct from the brokers? But brokers run the, the markets, the market system in Kenya. <laughs> brokers yeah. run it, because how many large-scale farmers do we have for them to supply directly to? Uh, the, the large millers, how mm. many? Mm. Then, actually, a majority of our production is small scale. Mm -hmm. So, for, for a mill, uh, there's no way a miller, uh, there's no way the large millers will go door to door to a farmer. Mm -hmm. They'll have to use brokers. A broker who didn't farm anything, by the way. So, <laughs> the marketing system is run by brokers, literally. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to point out one thing that he said. I'd like to echo it that yeah. the implementation. It's funny how our horticultural sector, 
that earns us export <laughs> Mm -hmm. has traceability standards. They can actually trace your tomatoes and up to your farm. Like from every step, it came from so-and-so's farm, it went to this exporter and it reached the European market. Why can't we borrow that for me? Mm -hmm. That's what is mentioning that we're not protecting charity begins at home. So for the European markets, they are standardized. They can trace your produce from weight up to the supply of the seed. So mm -hmm. that if the problem was not the farmer, the problem was the seed company. And they actually see you or, or uh, decline your produce. Mm -hmm. So why can't, we f why can't we borrow? Because Kenya signed the Eurogap Pact mm -hmm. that they, they'll follow these standards. Why can't we borrow those standards for maize, for these staples that we consume locally? Mm -hmm. And it will be much cheaper and easier to implement at the local level. Mm -hmm. yes. Speaking of local level, uh, the CSC a few days ago he brought in the <coughs> issue of transboundary trade. And we've also seen that there's a point uh, in the year where we lack maize, since it's a staple food, there is low production of maize. So we have to trade from Tanzania, Uganda, and you are not sure if that maize is safe. I, I think I'll, I'll question that. Yeah. Do we actually lack maize in Kenya? It's a because, political because crop. You'll, you'll you can find, never tell. You will find uh, at, uh, at some point hmm. what they normally do is create a need. When you create a need, of course, demand will go high. Mm -hmm. And when the demand will go high, if let's say, for example, this product that we're actually discussing here is, has been stored somewhere, because there are farmers who have their own stores, and you can bear witness with uh, this one. Their brokers, they buy maize, make sure that uh, that maize can actually stay from four to five months, waiting when the demand will be high, and then it, it will be released to the market. So when we blame the interboundary, uh, interboundary, uh, interboundary trade. Mm. How is that maize coming in from other countries without being tested? Mm -hmm. Who is allowing that product to come into our country to be consumed by our people with, uh, without actually being tested and seeing that this is good for human consumption? So we cannot actually put a blame on interboundary trade, whereby we have policies that have been put in place on the type of product that uh, can be imported and consumed by the by the people of our country mm. yes yeah. you want to address something yeah um, okay i actually get depressed when i think that we import maize in the 21st century in kenya mm -hmm. kenya cannot afford to import maize because first of all we are capable of producing even, even surplus and export our maize mm -hmm. because what maize are we importing from mexico yellow maize that they, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, we're importing yellow maize and we have white maize, how? So, there's, um, actually import is killing our maize industry. Mm -hmm. Because those countries we're importing from are producing at a lower price and selling at a lower price. Of course, when it gets here, the price is tripled. And then our farmers who toiled day and night are, remain with their produce. So if, if there's anything to go by, imports should be eliminated completely. Because still, with the, with, the, with the production we do, we lose 10% post-harvest, 10%, which is over, I don't know how many million tons per year. Mm -hmm. So if we could put proper post-harvest handling strategies, we don't need to import maize in the 21st century. In Kenya, by the way, mm. we, do not, we don't need <laughs> imports. Uh, going down to, to, our, to health matters, okay? Mm. Uh, people do not know the impact of aflatoxin on human health. They imagine maybe it's just maybe diarrhea or vomiting, but there are long-term impact on our health. Yes. I think one of the major, major, major impact that has uh, mm. been discussed and echoed day in, day out is uh, the impact that aflatoxin is having on uh, cancer, especially the liver cancer mm. and uh, liver cirrhosis and so on. Yeah. So this is one of the uh, issue that uh, Kenyans are discussing and they are saying uh, why are we having the cases of cancers increasing day in day out for example if you go to a hospital today a big a big number of people who are admitted there are actually going through chemos others are, are, are actually going through can uh, cancer treatment and so mm. on mm. so one of the major uh, impact that is going to dent us now 
mm. tomorrow and even in the future before actually we uh, been able to implement this policy because for example in uh, in 2009 the mm. means that were actually being discussed uh, that came into the country look at the impact it's being fe uh, the impact is being felt 10 years later mm. and it is the report that has actually been filed uh, by the then KEBS uh, CEO about the impact of aflatoxin to the human body is actually being felt right now. And this is just a beginning. What can we do to actually be able to see that in the next, let's say, for example, 10 years from now, we'll be able to reduce this number yes. and be able to go back to where we were as a nation? And coming to that, because there's a report uh, on that, agricultural research is and now calling for adoption of genetically modified maize to contain the rise of aflatoxin contamination. Regina Tende, that's a maize breeder at Kenya Agriculture Livestock and Research Organization, says GMO maize is a system to pests that causes breakage in maize, creating a breeding ground for the fungi that causes aflatoxin. This comes after Kenya Bureau of Standards suspended like five brands of maize flour on Saturday on concerns of high levels of aflatoxin contamination. Researcher says GMO maize is resistant to stem borers and fall armyworm that causes breakage in maize before and after harvest creating creating a conducive environment for the spread of toxin that cause aflatoxin research conduct at the Kiboko and Kitale Beti maize trials reveals that GMO maize is high yielding and has a low cost of production compared to convection maize. The Kenya Agricultural Livestock, Livestock and Research Organization is waiting approval before conducting a national field trial and commercial of GMO. Let me come to you, Dorcas. Yes. Is GMO the way forward? <laughs> what other measures can we put in place to, to avoid such cases? Mm, I remember <clears throat> some few years back, mm. the same way they were politicizing maize, mm. GM was politicized also. Yeah, I remember. Mm. And I think not we almost failed, we failed to implement it. But, okay, GM is the way to go. Because it is. it's the way to go. Of course, there are health concerns, there are health issues, but GM is the way to go. Mm. Because we have a growing population, we have reduced land sizes. Mm. We have changes in climatic changes in rainfall and mm. and, uh, and temperature. So our maize is not doing the same way it used to yield. Mm. So for, for, for sustainability of our population, mm. GMO is the way to go. But when it comes to health issues, there's so much research that needs to be done to ascertain the health status of the GMO foods. Okay. And not only for maize. Final comments as we <laughs> wind up. <laughs> uh, my final comments would be, we also, need to, we also need to be self-aware. Mm. We also need to be alert okay. with, the, with, the, with the technology and all that we have at our disposal. Mm. It's, good to, it's good to educate yourself mm. and know how to control aflatoxins okay, when it you. comes to your doorstep. Thank you so much. Andrew, final comments at way forward. Uh, quickly, mm. uh, two. Mm. One, we need uh, not to be ignorant mm -hmm. because when a, uh, when a report like this one comes out, let us not politicize it. Mm -hmm. Let us look into it as an individual mm -hmm. and uh, as, a, as a state. Secondly, there are policies that have been there on food security, and we have agencies that has been mandated to, make, to ensure that the kind of food that uh, Kenyans are consuming is actually at par. Mm -hmm. Let them do their work and ensure that we are safe from any kind of food that can actually dent our health. Well, thank you so much. That was Andrew Shonko, business analyst, and Dorcas Delango, agriculture economist. That brings the end to our discussion today. We're talking about food safety. We can keep this conversation going on our social media platform. Uh, you can find me directly at Miriam underscore myself. That is Twitter and Instagram. Hashtag to use is Y254 updates. Don't go anywhere because coming up next is the bus. Good night and God bless you. <laughs>